and good evening to everybody and welcome to this week's maternity and midwifery hour this is actually session six of week of series seven and i'm delighted to be with you uh, my name's sue mcdonald and i'm the happy curator of the maternity and midwifery hour and the maternity and midwifery festivals and tonight we're going to be joined by our two wonderful midwives zoe nelson and rachel mullins from sunny cornwall here they are <laughs> So welcome, Zoe and Rachel. Thank um, you, and I, mu I must mention that in this these COVID times, both have been have done their lateral flow tests. So that's why they're allowed to sit quite closely <laughs> to each other. So we have to make that very clear. And now, as we do with all of our guests, we put them on the spot and ask them for a little moment of the week. So can I have your moments of the week? Since you're both sitting together, we'll start with Rachel, maybe. Um, well, I've been fortunate enough to be on half term with my son this week. Ooh. So, yeah, <laughs> and it has actually been sunny Cornwall for a change. So um, we've been to the beach and we went swimming in the sea, which <gasps> was the best part of the week. No. But it was really <laughs> I bet that was chilly. It is love. <laughs> Um, I'm lucky enough to be on half term week as well, um, holiday as well. Um, and so far, I've had a really good week because I've had some friends um, that came down that we met in Lanzarote in 2018 and we've not seen since. Wow. So they came down and we took them to the Minac Theatre, which um, oh. went to see Carousel, the musical, which was absolutely lovely um, until the second half when it rained. But we're in, when in Cornwall. Oh. Well, I was going to say, I thought Cornwall was the best place to be this week because it, with me, it's been raining off and on for the last couple of days. I was feeling very jealous of Cornwall because it seems though the weather's a bit sunnier there, especially if you're swimming. Yeah, it has must been, have been OK. Yeah. Well, thank you lovely. very much for your moments. That's lovely. And, and it's, it's so nice to see. And, and actually, I, I do have to say a big thank you to Zoe and Rachel because they are using their holiday to speak to us. How good is that? So thank you so dedication. much. Dedication. <laughs> Absolute dedication. Now we just rem rem remind everybody, this maternity hour, mat maternity midwifery hour came at the beginning of the pandemic and we're carrying on, which is why we're coming on, on to series seven, on to series eight. And it's been a way of being able to help midwives, student midwives, anyone in maternity care, really connect, have some accessible continuing professional development and sort of updated information in a very accessible way. All looked after by Mapflix and a super resource if you want to do any uh, assignment works for those of you students of any sort. Um, for those of you who are doing your revalidation, it is a fantastic resource to dig through for any really interesting work really contemporary and very useful and it's all free and you can share and I hope you're going to be share, able to share this um, presentation tonight because I think it's going to be really useful and interesting to any midwives who are providing care to women in the families so do remember when you get your um, your cl clip from this you can actually share it with your colleagues and if you can't get it quickly enough just go to matflix and find it and take an opportunity in a quiet moment and i'm saying that with a um, it doesn't often happen these days maybe use it to have a, a sort of discussion group and that's also useful for those who are doing revalidation just a, another big thank you to our lovely midwives, lovely student midwives, maternity care support workers, everyone in the maternity services who were working so hard. As always, they never stop. But also everybody in the NHS who's also supporting people um, at the moment who, you know, I know we're coming to the, the end of another curve of COVID. Um, maybe things will calm down a little bit. I'm not sure. Maybe what they will do, hopefully. And then... I'll just say a big, you must look after yourselves at the moment as well, because you're looking after other people so hard. So respect. Now, news, I do my little news feature. And we've got, of course, it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Um, and I hope everyone gets a chance to have whatever celebration they want to have, whether it's a street party or whether it's just a, a quiet garden party or family party you're able to have. Um, and obviously get your lateral flows if, if you, you're you know, having contact with a lot of people, useful to do that or anyone who's vulnerable. Um, 
but enjoy the time. So I know some people aren't royalists, some people are, but you can still enjoy the fact you've got two two extra days to just have a bit of re- re- rest and recreation. So good for that. Now, I'm a little bit concerned this week because I understand there's some talk about looking at imperial measures. And I just have to say, I'm a little concerned about that. I've just I've got used after many years to, to kilos um, and it's going to be a little bit tricky to go back to pounds and ounces and, and all these rods and, and yards and all that malarkey. So I'm hoping we'll stick with our nice kilos and everything. Now, last week we had the publication of the Black um, Maternity Experience Survey. Still have it. Still. It's accessible online and I've put that on your resources sheet. I would really, really recommend you read this. It's uncomfortable reading but I think it's really important we need to listen because one of the things that women the women in this whole survey said we didn't have a voice and I think it's important all of our women and all of our um, families have voices that we are listening to we're really listening so that's your homework again for those who didn't do your homework last week sobering reading and also the biggest thing from that report also is a lot of people make assumptions and I think it's important and we should, we need to know that as midwives. We mustn't make assumptions. What's right for one woman isn't right for another. What one woman's experience is like, isn't like another woman's. And we need to make sure we're really giving what we say we are. We always say we give individualized care. We give personalized care. Well, we've got to prove that we do do it. So don't make assumptions. Um, my tweet. Now you, anyone who knows me knows I'm a tweeter. And my tweet of the the week was a really nice tweet about a poster for kangaroo care, proper latching and breast milk expression storage. And it's in English and Vietnamese. And it was just a really nice tweet. I, I love graphics and I love the fact that increasingly, and especially in the UK, we're going in for little graphics. So people who are doing home births are doing little graphics about how many births they've had, how many babies are breastfed, breastfed etc and I think that's such a good way of communicating with our whole staff but also the women and and families within our care but of course there's other things in in the news that aren't so nice two million people thought to be suffering long covid and we know how debilitating that can be the war in Ukraine I mean that's just horrendous what's happening there and of course the ongoing cost of living of crisis but and the increased talk about people skipping meals and having to 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 keep their heating switched off i mean it's not such a problem as as it will be in the winter but i think what it feels like is a very difficult time the time we need to look out for each other and care for each other so that's the end of that's the end of the news flash now now this week we're looking at developing a perinatal pelvic health service and you might remember um, listening to our chief midwife, Jack, Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, talking about the importance of per- perinatal pelvic health. And we're going to hear all about what, what, how it's being done. Um, because in 2021, the NHS announced the setting up of these pelvic care, health clinics to support pregnant women and new mums to prevent and treat incontinence and other pelvic floor issues to just move away from the assumption that you can you should put up with incontinence as a normal result after childbirth so this is going to be really excellent and I'm so pleased to introduce firstly Zoe Nelson who's been a midwife in Cornwall in the Isles Isles of Scilly for 26 years she looks far too young for that she's enjoying a, a varied career as a specialist midwife sonographer delivery suite coordinator and maternity matron her current role as lead lmns lead midwife supports the nhs long-term plan for maternity transformation one of the work streams focuses on pelvic health which is why she's here today with a keen interest in robust quality improvement and methodology the ambition is to prevent and mitigate pelvic floor dysfunction and morbidity surrounding pelvic health that results from childbirth and pregnancy. And she is joined by the lovely Rachel Mullins, who studied at Bournemouth University and returned home to be a midwife in Cornwall and Isles of Scilly in 2016. And I must say that was a good decision, Rachel. Very good decision. Rachel has had experience across all areas of maternity, having worked in acute community and midwifery-led birth centre 
birth center set, setting, sorry. Rachel has a particular interest in evidence-based perineal trauma prevention, repair and aftercare, and is actively involved in research and training in the field. And her current role as specialist perinatal pelvic health midwife has enabled wider collaboration with obstetric midwifery and physiotherapy colleagues, which I think we're going to hear all about. So welcome, Rachel and Zoe. I have to say now the screen is yours. Thank, Thank you, you for coming to share your work with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Just get the slideshow up a minute. Fantastic. Are we there? Perfect. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It's an um, absolute pleasure to be here with the opportunity to show off um, what we've been doing. Um, and um, if we go on to the next slide. Um, so um, as a midwifery ambassador, I remember going to my midwifery ambassador training um, with Jackie and Jackie had three um, very um, top priorities um, when she was new in post. And one of them was the pelvic health um, service. Another was to raise the pro profile of our profession and also um, the leadership in our profession. Um, pelvic health is very close to my heart. And little did I know then that I would be the LMNS midwife who um, submitted a bid to be an early implementer in um, January 2021. And we were um, successful at that. And um, we're one of 14 in the country. Um, and it's been a really exciting um, place to be. Um, and raising the profile of um, women's health and perinatal pelvic health is, is really important. Um, so that's the quote from our chief midwifery officer there. So there's, um, there's three national drivers that um, are really important in this project. Um, and the first is to prevent and mitigate um, pelvic floor dysfunction resulting from pregnancy and childbirth. And that includes things like uh, routine antenatal education, adherence to the pelvic floor muscle training, um, baseline self-assessment um, at booking, um, and additional targeted antenatal and postnatal care for those that are um, at more at high risk, for example, those who've had an assisted delivery or third or fourth degree tears, those with a raised BMI, um, those that don't speak English um, or maybe have a lower level of um, capacity for reading um, and things like that. And also to adopt practices um, that mitigate um, um, risks such as the OAC um, bundle of care, as well as um, the quality wound care um, support. The second one is improving the rate of identification of pelvic floor issues, and that includes the provision of quality information for not just um, women and families, but also um, staff in, and including the wider primary care team um, and an assessment tool to help clinicians and um, women and, um, and birthing people to identify risks um, as, and issues as well. Um, and the third one is ensure timely access to NICE recommended treatment, which also includes establishing the uh, service as a single point of access and a one stop um, clinic service. Um, reducing the referral to treatment times um, and increasing a local establishment of um, specialists, uh, physiotherapists and midwives and providing the leadership for um, uh, local planning in, in services. Zoe. <clears throat> so just before I go on to talk a bit more about the problem and the background to why we um, were so keen to be part of the early implementers of the perinatal pelvic health, health program, um, the our per perinatal pelvic health services come about as a as a huge collaboration between a lot of people. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's been involved, from NHS England down to all of our lovely colleagues who've been referring women and birthing people into the service, identifying people early, getting them treated, that really is key to all of this. Um, so if we have a little look now, dig into the background of why is it so important? Why is it important to have these perinatal pelvic health services? And what's the impact? So as most of you will be aware, um, women's health issues tend to be, um, tend to be marginalized. There doesn't seem to be um, as much research into women's health issues. Um, as there are two other aspects of uh, health and social care. So particularly, uh, that's particularly the case when we're talking about childbirth, um, injuries sustained during childbirth, perineal trauma, postnatally and during pregnancy. Um, perineal wounds currently 
Um, prior to perinatal pelvic health services, there has been very little specialist provision for follow-up care for women who sustain perineal trauma or pelvic health problems during pregnancy and the childbirth continuum. Um, infections, it was often the case that women with perineal wound breakdown or infections would uh, have to see their GP um, and would often be prescribed antibiotics. Um, and there wasn't any real specialist provision, as I say, for following up and monitoring wound healing, because obviously GPs are extremely busy at the moment. Um, as you'll be aware, wounds that have broken down heal by secondary intention. So where there's been an infection, the wounds take longer to heal. Um, and that's a longer, more painful process and often leads to the formation of granulation or overgranulation tissue. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about some of the treatments we're able to offer through the service for that later. Um, not only the physical aspect um, of, of wound, perineal wounds, but also the lifelong social and psychological implications for birthing people have come, uh, are starting to come out more now, and there's more awareness around that. Um, historically, women have been reticent to seek help for, um, for obvious reasons. They find it an, an embarrassing uh, thing to do. It's... Um, exhausting, having to access multiple resources, multiple healthcare providers. And it's such an intimate, intimate problem um, that, you know, exposing your, exposing those parts of your body to multiple different people is, is obviously very challenging. And that's traumatizing. And feelings of abandon, abandonment and isolation are commonly reported by women who sustain pelvic health and perineal injuries during birth. Um, from a pelvic health point of view, prolapse is very, very common, affecting about one in three women who've had children. Um, and lots of you will be aware that serious pelvic girdle pain um, is very prevalent in the, uh, with, with uh, pregnancy and uh, with birthing, birthing people. So about 7% of women postpartum and many, many more antenatally as well. Birthing people report be feeling uh, being irreparably damaged by pelvic organ prolapse. So it's really, really important that, uh, that services are there to support women and birthing people experiencing that. And of course, it's not just an impact um, on the service users. There's a huge impact for the NHS. Um, obstetric injuries are the fourth highest reason for claims in obstetrics. And the total value of costs and claims in that area are estimated to be around £48 million per year. 85% of those claims are related to misdiagnosis of perineal trauma. So it's really, really important that we've got that, those fundamental teaching um, processes and skills in place at an undergraduate and a post-qualification level as well. And there's the ongoing cost of surgical repairs um, in theatre, and subsequent deliveries by caesarean section, potentially. Um, in terms of the incidence and prevalence, um, it does appear that um, the rates of obstetric anal sphincter injuries are on the rise, um, but fortunately the incidence of perineal tears decreases with subsequent births. We're hoping that um, with better education and a more intense focus on um, pelvic health issues, we're hoping to see those rates come down and actually part of the national, the NHS England national KPIs, one of the key performance indicators is to reduce the rates of obstetric anal sphincter injury. So we're hoping to be um, you know, successful with, with that. So in, in 2020, um, our Kerno Maternity Voices Partnership um, surveyed um, service users across Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and this is just a few of the um, highlights really that um, that um, uh, you know you can see from the the um, percentages there that actually um, midwives who discuss ways to minimize or prevent perineal trauma was actually very few um, and the blues are the, the those that answered positively and said yes and then the oranges are those that um, answered negatively and said no um, we also know that um, service users um, didn't know where to access um, information on pelvic health um, symptomatic service users being referred to NHS um, 
physios um, were fewer than the, than who needed them, um, and pelvic health negatively affecting their mental health. And that was a high number. And um, those who had a negative impact on um, their sex life and, and intimacy and relationships. Um, the, the other highlights is that there was little awareness of a chance of, of, of pelvic pain um, or fecal or flatus um, incontinence, which was a real eye opener. Yet 85% of um, service users surveyed um, were aware of um, the, the likelihood of leaking, which it was very suggestive of it being a normal, um, normalised, um, which obviously we needed to change the narrative over. And then the recommendations from the report were very much about um, increasing information and knowledge, training, um, supporting clear pathways um, for service users to access further support. So we were really able to utilise our, our Maternity Voices Partnership survey and the, and the results um, with a, what we were going to be doing locally. So we really developed our service and our ambitions for our service around what our service users actually said and actually we were very congratulated um, in our um, bid for, for doing that so that would be one thing I would definitely recommend is liaising with your Kerno Maternity Voices Partnership in order to or your not Kerno but your Maternity Voices Partnership in order to ascertain what your local population are needing. So we thought we would tailor this to Cornwall and give you an overview of some of the um, statistics and make it relevant to this area so that you can see why it was necessary. Um, this is an overview of um, the different types of perineal trauma that occurred in our trust um, dur for, during 2020 to 2021. And you can see um, broadly it fits in with the national data that the highest rates are um, of the first and second degree tears. Um, episiotomy we know occurs in about one in seven births, um, but that does fluctuate between areas as well. And thankfully, we had quite low um, statistics of third and fourth degree tears. But again, that's always subject to change. And one of the really important aspects of the pelvic health service is that we're scrutinising the data um, a lot more closely now um, and trying to find and extrapolate themes as to why um, and what might be causing these to see if there's anything that we can do proactively to change that. Um, I should point out that um, these statistics don't include anything around uh, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic floor dysfunction, and our physiotherapy referrals. This is purely around the, um, the obstetric statistics. So we thought we would um, show you a short video. It's five minutes, just a quick summary of um, what, for what we're doing. Um, this was shared with NHS England um, and it is available on the Futures flat platform, but we thought it gave just a good, good coverage and a good introduction to who we are and some of the other people that are involved in this uh, fantastic project. If you can't hear, um, let us know because we might have to go back in and tick the shared sound box. Sorry. <laughs> it's always, you always have to tick that little pesky box for sharing mm. sound. Is that okay? Can you see? Yeah. <laughs> Did you check the share? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Hold on. Sorry. Uh, I think we are. Hold on. Yeah. Hi, my name is Zoe Nelson. I'm LMS lead midwife for Cornwall and the Isle of Scilly. I'm leading our perinatal public health service and our early implementer project. 
I'd like to introduce you to our project team who will take you through um, our history of our project and the vision for the future. And it's something that we're really excited and passionate to be able to bring to you today. Hi, I'm Rachel Mullins. I'm the specialist pelvic health midwife for the Early Implementer Pelvic Health Project at Royal Cornwall Hospital. Hi hey everyone, I'm Rachel Collett. I'm the pelvic floor dysfunction clinical lead physiotherapist. Um, so the idea for the Pelvic Health Clinic initially came up about three years ago uh, when I was working as a community midwife after spending some time working as an acute midwife in the hospital. I felt that Cornwood, Cornwood would really benefit from having its own perineal pathway to follow up women who sustained perineal trauma during childbirth. So I submitted an Improve Well idea through the Improve Well app which was a way for frontline staff to submit their ideas and for them to be actioned and implemented. The idea was, and so I went on to present to our head of midwifery, our specialist consultant, the LMNS and Care and Maternity Voices Partnership. And the project has grown from there. I'm Nikki Burnett, Chair of Kano MVP. The MVP worked alongside Cornwall LMNS to develop the Postnatal Care Action Plan in line with the guidance on postnatal care published by NHS England. To support this work, we developed and conducted an online survey and engagement to examine what the current off offer looked like and how service users felt about the support which was offered to them. We asked women and birthing people about their experiences and asked them to share the impact their pelvic health and sub subsequent care had on their mental health, their physical health, and their sexual relationships. The findings from this engagement are what informed and influenced the design of our pelvic health service and subsequent application to be an early implementer site. It was important to us to ensure the voices of those that would use the service were present right from the start and that that service was built around their needs. Over the last 18 months, the pelvic floor physiotherapy service consisting of myself and Kirsty Sturgeon have been working alongside Rachel Mullins and other services trying to plan a more robust service for all women with perineal trauma following delivery. Our driving force for this has been that we feel all women who sustain perineal trauma should have equal access to an MDT approach to manage their perineal trauma and pelvic floor muscle training. From the outset, collaborative working, equitable care and being able to offer meaningful evidence-based support and treatment to women and birthing people in Cornwall has been at the heart of this project. Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly are incredibly proud to have been chosen as an early implementer site. We've considered and reflected on potential challenges as Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly have a unique geography which can make delivering accessible healthcare difficult. Our one acute maternity unit covers the whole of the county and our community midwives and physiotherapy teams are spread over a wide area. However, our vision and commitment to improve perineal and pelvic health locally and nationally is already having a positive impact. During the preparation for our new service, women and birthing people have come forward to express their hope and relief that such support will now be available. Our project team have the diverse range of knowledge and skills to achieve our goals. We're enjoying networking and sharing ideas with other early implementer schemes and our team are part of national forums of specialists who share our passion for improving perineal and pelvic health. We are working with our clinical school to implement research in this area and are very excited about what the future holds. Thanks, Amy. Can you see our screen again? Brilliant. So hopefully that just gave you a really brief overview of some of the things you've already mentioned, but um, and gives you a bit of background into um, to what was going on down here. Um, we touched on it a little bit in the video, but um, in Cornwall, prior to the establishment of the new service, um, there was limited provision. Um, there was no specialist follow up for those um, women in birthing and people sustaining first and second degree tears. The B Brown Vasavig Safety IV Catheter with Passive Safety Tech. Oops, sorry. <laughs> That's the sorry, next that. video on YouTube. That's the next video on YouTube. <laughs> there we go. Oh, technology. Mm, love it. it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's always great fun. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was not for court leads. <laughs> okay. We're better midwives than we are text. Absolutely. <laughs> no, Amazing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> The, the toolbar's in the tool, our way, yeah. The toolbar's off the other slide screen now. Okay, we'll go down to the right one. It's fine, got it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so limited uh, limited follow-up for those people sustaining first and second degree tears, episiotomies or perineal wound dehiscence. Um, and as you we're all aware, there's a routine... Um, there's a national shortage of midwives as well. So the routine postnatal midwifery care is often limited um, to, to what the service can provide at the time. So we're not always able to provide that in-depth follow-up, um, particularly regarding perineal care and uh, pelvic health issues as well. Um, those sustaining third and fourth degree tears will have an appointment, a routine appointment with an obstetric uh, consultant, which is a fantastic follow-up. Um, however, again, due to the sheer volume of work, those appointments can be delayed and advice can sometimes differ between areas. And that's certainly something we've noticed nationally. As I say, there's a consultant-led perineal clinic for symptomatic um, third or fourth degree tears, which is run by our wonderful consultant. Um, but again, time is limited and so is the funding for that. We do have a specialist pelvic floor dysfunction physiotherapy service, and we've worked very, very closely with the physios um, from that service to implement the perinatal pelvic health service as well, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. The aim, our aims overall, though, were to have continuity of carer. Um, that's one of the key aspects of this. And as you said at the beginning, Sue, we know, we know the value of that. There's plenty, plenty of evidence underpinning how, how valuable that is. And good education. So as we said, um, pre-reg and post-reg, really, really important to have that ongoing, ongoing and developing education because as we want everything to remain evidence-based and obviously things change um, as research is released. We wanted improved antenatal and postnatal resources. That was something that came out of our Maternity Voices Partnership Survey. Um, and we wanted a single point of access for all the referrals and self-referrals. That again was something that NHS England were very, very focused on and something we felt was really, really important. Um, because again, we wanted to simplify the process as much as possible and make it as efficient as possible so that we can see those people who need it, need it most as quickly as possible. We want an inclusive and easily accessible service for Cornwall. And we were hoping to, we're hoping to develop an online pelvic health hub that can be accessed by any women and birthing people in Cornwall and their families as well, because um, we don't have time to get into that today, but the families um, of women and birthing people experiencing the um, symptoms and the conditions that we've been talking about, they're often very, very um, severely affected as well. We're aiming to expand our provision to other types of perineal trauma and pelvic health issues. At the moment, we've had to implement a phased criteria um, for who can access the service. And Zoe will talk to you a bit more about that in a bit, but um, we've had to limit it and we're hoping to be able to expand that as time goes on. We've talked already briefly about quality improvement, so I won't stay too long on this, um, but essentially this is the pathway that we took. Um, Zoe drove it forward with a um, quality improvement pathway, um, and we went, which started in 2019, and that our clinics actually opened in December 2021. As I say, our current referral criteria um, are quite limited, um, and this is just a, an overview of, of who can access the service at the moment. And again, we're hoping to expand that. We're able to see all of those with third and fourth degree tears, episiotomies, all forms of FGM, fistula, and those that are readmitted to the hospital for any sort of perineal wound complication or suspected wound dehiscence or infection. The physiotherapists in particular are following up those um, who've had a manual removal of placenta, had a breech delivery or a multiple birth, um, women in birthing people who've been involved with shoulder dystocias, and instrumental deliveries and large babies 
and also a prolonged second stage because the impact, um, those risk factors are known to have, uh, have a bigger impact on uh, long-term and short-term pelvic health. And crucially, we're having self-referrals into the service. We're really encouraging that and trying to share that with the midwives and all of our allied uh, health professional colleagues so that they can spread the word and women and birthing people feel enabled and empowered to, to self-refer. Currently, we're seeing women and birthing people up to 12 months postnatally. Again, that's something that hopefully we'll be able to expand in time, um, but there was it was necessary to limit that, and that was the NHS England guidance. So at the moment, as I say, we're having this phased expansion of the referral criteria. The physiotherapists and I run uh, two clinics per week at the, at the hospital in Truro. Um, with, there's always a physiotherapist and always a midwife present at each clinic. So if there are um, multiple, multiple issues, then we can liaise and people get seen in a timely manner. If they don't have to come back for multiple appointments and such like. Um, we, the clinicians, triage the referrals as they come through into that one-stop um, referral service, and we contact uh, women and birthing people to provide the initial assessment and treatment and make an individualised care plan from then on. As I said, we have a team continuity of care approach. We found that invaluable, and the feedback so far is that um, obviously our service users feel that's a benefit of what, as well. If necessary, we're fortunate that we can make onward referrals into our day assessment unit for acute cases, and we can also refer on into the bladder, bowel, and birth reflections and services as required. So just to give you an overview, it's, we do go into some of the challenges that we've had later on, and we touched on it earlier, but geography is certainly one of them. You can see that um, with, there's the one unit in Truro, um, and that's where we have the main PPHS clinic and our main uh, community physiotherapist is based there. But we've tried wherever possible to get coverage across the county. So we do have a community based physiotherapist within the um, pelvic health service in Bodmin. And we have another physiotherapist further um, west down in Campbell and Redruth. But you can see that the geography is a potential challenge. Mm. In terms of the treatments we're able to offer, um, they're expanding all of the time and we've had brilliant support from our um, obstetric consultants to, to really expand that provision with an evidence-based approach. So we provide individualised care planning for perineal trauma and pelvic health risk factors and that includes starting discussions about future mode of delivery after having an obstetric anal sphincter injury. Um, a lot of the feedback that we have um, from people that we've seen has been um, well, in two, it tends to go two ways. Some people say they they wish they're, they're glad they hadn't they didn't know about um, the potential for obstetric anal sphincter injury prior to birth, and other people say they wish they they did know. So again, like I say, it's individualising that care planning, and that touches on education and awareness as well. Wound care and monitoring that's probably the main thing from the midwifery point of view. Um, that we we monitor the wound care, we monitor the wounds, and we provide uh, we provide treatments. We talk about perineal massage for scar tissue, and we try and do um, antenatal and postnatal education education around that. There is the option for resuturing, and there have been some cases that have come through the perinatal pelvic health service that have gone on to have resuturing or surgical um, surgical repairs. Um, we talk about. Um, defecation dynamics, how to improve people's well-being um, postnatally. We can apply silver nitrate for granulation, over granulation, um, which again is having really, really good positive results. And we've had great feedback about that as well. And we do topical antimicrobial application as well. We talked briefly about the clinical team, but we have two great um, consultants on board. Uh, Farah is our consultant urogynecologist and an obstetrician. John's our consultant obstetrician. And then there's me as the midwife, two um, senior physiotherapists and three fantastic community physiotherapists based across Cornwall, as we said, just to try and bridge the gap in geography across the county. We've got our single point of access set up now, and that's been great. We have found that that's been a real, really simple and effective way of monitoring all of the referrals that come in. And as I say, we triage um, those referrals and we collaborate with other services within the trust. 
So it's been a steep rise in the in demand for the service since we started in December. You can see, I think, on our first clinic that we started on three appointments and that rapidly rose to 158 by March of this year. Across all of the physiotherapy and midwifery appointments, we've seen more than 550 people and had more than 550 appointments, certainly, since December 2021. And as I said earlier, we've had two, two referrals for surgical treatment, um, quite significant surgical treatment. So um, it, it's really important to understand some of the challenges which any anybody listening that is um, um, you know submitting for to be a fast follower or thinking about the service that they might um, um, have in the future, um, it's really Im important that we think we talk to you about our challenges because I think you probably could um, gain quite a lot from that. Geography we've we've already talked about obviously we span um, a large area and. Um, accessibility was something really important to us, but we've we've only been able to um, um, have the three different clinics in in the three areas that we've already pointed out. I think it's really important to think about our staffing um, and the um, the the funding that we were given by NHS England doesn't actually um, um, support our um, staffing wages um, at the minute. So um, we are having some challenges around it being a cost pressure. Um, each of our um, community physios do one, um, one clinic a week for the pelvic health service because they're a point two each. Um, and so therefore there's limited capacity. The um, specialist midwife, Rachel, was um, a point six, so she, which is not even enough um, full time. So there is some real capacity issues around that. And then we've got the point eight, um, both band seven physios are point four each. So there is some um, real tricky um, demands over capacity um, and that will um, um, be negative, um, have a negative impact on our delays to follow up. We're already seeing that our clinics are really booking up very fast. Um, and one of the um, national KPIs is about um, referral to treatment time. So um, it will be something that we'll be monitoring. Um, there is no um, capacity for any project management as the LMNS um, lead midwife I've been project managing um, it so far however this in the current challenging times um, is likely to change because my role will be required to do other things as I'm sure you're all aware um, and um, the the IT systems are really um, tricky as well because um, we're not an ICS uh, so we've got a, our Cornwall Foundation Trust and then our acute trust and there is different IT systems so there's no single um, place for um, documentation and that's because that's a challenge um, and, and something we have to overcome. Um, we have got dedicated clinic space at the minute um, but um, things always change so it's it's to ensure that we keep that um, resource. Um, it was quite tricky to get that resource in the first place and as we increase our if we're able to increase our um, clinics um, if we get further funding then we'll obviously have issues with um, our clinic space. Accessing um, our wider um, primary health care and our community um, for education and training and raising um, public awareness is, is going to be challenging, especially with the footprint that we've been given for our staffing as to who, who we can do that with. So we're liaising very care, very closely with our public health colleagues um, who are very keen to support. So it's good links with our council has been really invaluable. Um, and um, our inclusion criteria, we would love to um, increase our inclusion criteria. So it's a it's a um, access accessible for, for everybody. Um, again, if we can't um, increase our staffing, that's not going to be necessarily um, possible. Um, something that was a huge learning curve for us was how um, our services are commissioned. So Rachel's already talked about the, um, the um, um, pelvic floor dysfunction service, the PFD service. Um, and that's a commission service for um, already. So for us to change that and bring it into our pelvic health service to be a holistic service, we'll have to do um, some, some work with the commissioners. Um, and that's going to be um, quite politically tricky, I would imagine. Um, so that's that's been a huge learning curve for us because we thought we would bring everybody into our pelvic health service and we'd have a holistic service and we would be starting off with those that are most at high risk. And that's not been the case. We've had to keep those that are high risk in the PFD service and the MSK service 
Um, and we take the criteria of the women that weren't being seen at all, that didn't have a pathway. So that's been a big um, learning curve for, for all of us and something that wasn't highlighted to us when we um, were liaising with the uh, relevant stakeholders in the first place. Um, and then also um, the national KPIs and our data collection is going to be a challenge because of, um, of what the national team are asking of us. Um, we're needing to survey every single um, um, service user postnatally um, and they already have the friends and family, et cetera, et cetera. So it's how to bring that together so it's not going to be an inconvenience to our service users. Um, and then also they're, they're asking for a survey through the public health service or so anybody who accesses the public health service has a survey as well. So which would be um, probably a bit easier than the, the, the wider population. Um, so there are some um, challenges and we're learning as we go along, but we've got a really good team um, and support from the national team um, who are listening to us and hopefully will support um, those fast followers um, and um, everybody else to come on board um, at easier times as well. So going forward, this is our um, aims. These are some of our aims for the future. We've touched on some of them already, but we're aiming to contact and train GPs and allied, allied health professionals in Cornwall about how to refer into the, to the perinatal pelvic health service and, of course, about the referral criteria. We're hoping, obviously, for an expanded service provision and continued collaboration with other pelvic health specialists at a national level. And I think the one really, really positive thing that has come out of the um, NHS England promotion of perinatal pelvic health services is that there's so much more taking place on social media. In the media generally, there are conversations. So I've noticed, for instance, in The Guardian but and on social media, lots of other platforms where previously those articles and those topics weren't discussed, they're now being discussed nationally and internationally, which is brilliant. And there are groups forming now um, of co collaborations between uh, perineal midwives and physiotherapists, which is brilliant. We'll carry on collaborating with our fantastic Maternity Voices partnership and get as much service user involvement as possible. We're very conscious that the service needs was it started being driven by service users and it needs to continue to be what service users want, not what we perceive is needed. An improved digital interface, including online referrals would be fantastic. That would simplify things for us immensely. And we've said already, improved training and practical support for all healthcare providers. So we've liaised with um, health visitors and others that are seeing women and birthing people postnatally um, and providing support so that they know about us and how to access the service. We're really keen to take part in and contribute to research. That's something that interests me immensely. And we're looking at ways to do that as a team and to influence the national pelvic health agenda and advocate for Cornwall as a centre of excellence. And that's us. So, yeah, I'm happy to share um, anything that we can with people who um, um, want, want anything. Our emails will be on the presentation um, and our Twitter handles there. You can see happy for anybody to contact us. Fabulous. That's absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much, Rachel and Zoe, for, for that presentation. Because it's, it's quite astounding to think of. I mean, I love this idea of the fast followers and, and, and I'm hoping that people who are watching are getting very excited about the potential for this. When you think about 553 women just in this period of time, I mean, that's, a, that's stunning, actually. And it just shows what the need is. So thank you very much for sharing that. And also, I think sharing that it's not straightforward and there's all sorts of political stuff you need to organise. You have to think further. You have to think about money. You have to think about staffing and space. And you have to think about organising all of these things. And, and the stuff that you take for granted, that we, we kind of take for granted, like IT, where some IT doesn't talk to other IT, and we still haven't got that sorted in the NHS, which is crazy. Anyway, I'd like to say a, bit, a big hello, because we've got, we've got people from Greece, Algeria, and USA joining us today. So hello to all of you, and welcome. And um, We have a, a few questions coming in. If you've got any questions, we have got a short time for some questions. And, and we've got, the first question is Eunice Atsali, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Eunice. And she says, thank you, team, for the wonderful job. 
Just wondering about the prevention measures in place for perineal integrity. The focus is more on trauma care, but just wondering about the prevention. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, so probably most people will be aware um, that there is lots of research going on into that and the discussion has uh, the perinatal public health service has prompted that sort of discussion um the oac care bundle um, is probably the most well-known um preventative strategy that's out there at the moment and that's a collaboration between the royal college of obstetricians and gynecologists royal college of midwives and and others um, and they've now they trialed the oac care bundle and they've now moved on to the oac care bundle two so the um, sequel is out and being used in practice and being trialed um, so it will be interesting to see the results of that and it's really interesting in terms of midwifery topics of conversation um, hands on hands off lots of midwives will feel really really differently about that and have their reasons for that and likewise have evidence for it in both in both camps so it's a really interesting point for discussion I think as I say within the perinatal pelvic health service um, we will be looking into the, the data from um, women and birthing people that come into our service to see if we can identify themes that would better inform us and our practices, our trust around prevention. But I think NHS, the results nationally, as what comes out from NHS England, will be really interesting in terms of prevention of perineal trauma. And I think one of the, um, the national KPIs is about um, adherence to pelvic floor muscle training. So um, there'll be the, the education and training around that because we might all think that we do our pelvic floor training correctly, but actually in reality we don't. And therefore um, are we giving the right information? It's not good enough just to say, are you doing your pelvic floor muscle training? We are going to have to measure it in some way. So it will have to be co come into our paperwork, our documentation, um, and so that we can prove that we are giving that information and it'll probably well be service user driven um, as um, as a data collection that were you um, informed how do you feel about doing them that sort of thing mm. um, so that we can um, be reassured and assured that, um, that that we are delivering on that KPI it's a really good question thank you that's great that's a good one Eunice thank you she also also adds a little PS of also speaking on the current care of episiotomy repairs. The care is so diverse here in Kenya. Ah, oh, Eunice, you're in Kenya. All done. Okay. But I think I think we'd probably agree with that. that's probably similar in the UK, actually, that the diverse care and kind of approach to episiotomy still there are various varied yeah. approaches, even though there is has research direct certain things doesn't it mm. and we've got something a comment from France and this is from Nora Vallejo if I've pronounced that correctly she says congratulations on the implementing a vital service for women absolutely the impact of severe perineal trauma on the quality of women's health should be incentive enough to ensure funding especially when considering the amount paid out in claims yeah absolutely and and something that I feel really strongly about because I, I personally suffered from it, is the PGP, the pelvic girdle pain, and I'm still suffering from it. My youngest is 13. Okay. So um, I don't wow. feel that we're doing enough around this. Uh, even as a midwife, my knowledge was really poor. I don't think our guidelines support um, proper care um, and follow-up care. And I think having a service that supports that will be fun absolutely vital. Um, so um, it is something that we still need to campaign for. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, that that's amazing. 13 years. So you've had that sort of remind. My goodness. OK. And Izzy says, thank you for this. Excited to see it in practice as a student midwife. Do you think the OAC care bundle should be implemented nationally? Oh, <laughs> that's a controversial question. Isn't oh, it? Izzy, well done. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a good one yeah. for your assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's and look at um, all the references you could have for Rachel. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm part of a group of specialist perineal midwives nationally, and um, Lizzie Percy is actually the link midwife with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So Lizzie would, uh, is certainly someone to, to look up um, because she would be the best person to talk about that. But I think it's, it's the, the OEC care bundle is really, it's really worth reading and getting to know and formulating your own opinions around that 
Um, there are, it is controversial. Um, I think any sort of prescribed approach to midwifery is always challenging um, just because of the nature of the work that we do. Um, but the evidence is there. There is a lot of very well researched and um, you know, good quality evidence around the recommendations in the OAC care bundle. Um, but I think the, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for the data to see whether it is something that becomes na implemented nationally. We're having some interesting conversations with our Maternity Voices Partnership yeah. over that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's going to be an interesting um, journey to travel, I think. I think what, what's been really lovely is actually the, 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 this is your work really illustrates a partnership, yeah. which is really very strong and very, it makes the project even more special, yeah. um, which is fantastic and, and long may it continue. I mean, I was just wondering, this is my, my chance to get a question, um, whether you are able to bring in students to be part of the or whether they get experience at, at attending a clinic or a couple of clinics to get a more experience. Yeah, absolutely. We completely encourage that. As we, as we said, one of our underpinning ethos is, is, to, is to support and improve education around not only prevention of perineal trauma, but certain, certainly we've noticed around the identification, as you saw from those statistics from, the, um, from litigation, misdiagnosis or, um, you know, or incorrect diagnosis is, is, is an issue. Yeah. Definitely. So I think we, we definitely need to focus on that. And we've had, it's been lovely because we've had student midwives based in our trust who've asked to come to the clinic and absolutely, absolutely encourage that because it's, it's quite a rare privilege and it's a rare opportunity to, to see women and birthing people that frequently postnatally. As we oh. said, one of the main issues is that postnatal, current postnatal care doesn't always allow for, for that intensive support, which and that for that reason, as a student or sometimes even as a midwife, you don't see, you just don't see postnatally um, perineal healing, don't see perineal trauma and gauge its, gauge its progress and its pathway to complete healing and identification and management of any problems. So um, I think it's a really good thing for students to do to and get I, exposure to that. And I think what we're doing is building it into our mandatory training as well, which our students are exposed to. Fabulous. So, um, so therefore, it's a sustainable way of, of supporting up to date information and going into uh, the universities to um, support some of the teaching as well. Mm. Um, and then our, um, our students often have like a specialist um, or, you know, um, a, ability to have some um, time as our specialist, oh, like advice, which obviously, yeah, yeah, which obviously Rachel will be, Fabulous. will be one of those. Fabulous. That's fantastic. And in fact, I've, I have a, a, a query from Georgia Walker. This is one of the last questions, I think. Do you think more mandatory training regarding pelvic floor and perineal care should be available to health professionals from all areas and levels? What do you yeah, think this think, could include? Now, Georgia, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's 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 a really good question, and I think that would be that's one of our challenges is to get to our wider primary care support. Um, and you know, having conversations about pelvic um, floors it should be happening when when um, women routinely go for their smear tests, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, grabbing every single opportunity we can, needing to get change um, education and the curriculum uh, for because the nice guidance is for twelve years up for um, pelvic floor training. So if you talk to a 12 year old about their pelvic floor muscle, they won't know what it is. So it needs to be <laughs> embedded into the education. But as far as yeah. this, um, our staff are concerned, uh, training, um, yearly training and update um, built into our mandatory training is a must. But Rachel's um, devised um, some special um, training as well to introduce the service. We, we're talking at team meetings and the community team meetings and um, our maternity forum, which is multidisciplinary led. We've got uh, the good support of our obstetricians and our urogynecologists who, who support the, the education for the, for the doctors as well. Um, and building it into our personalised um, care plan um, uh, planning as well and that training um, for informed consent. Um, and those conversations that you have to change the narrative, but also empower um, women and birthing people to, um, to, to support their, their health as well in the way that they want to. 
I would say as well, a particularly difficult aspect of teaching suturing is that it can't be done online. So obviously the <laughs> pandemic caused enormous problems for, for yeah. practical skills and revalidating yeah. and consolidating practice, practical skills. So, yeah, it would be fantastic to implement it more. Yeah. Um, but obviously that would require a change in, yeah, yeah. in the current circumstances. Yeah, no, that's grand. I mean, it, it was as you were talking earlier, I was thinking, I wonder if, and we've had this discussion about postnatal care in the hour and at the festivals about the, that, that many women don't get very much and you've actually reinforced that they don't get very much postnatal care and I wonder if they got more postnatal care whether it would actually pick up more issues before it became dif more difficult for women just a thought for the future but anyway well, well and hope, hopefully antenatal education will support and empower people to identify themselves i mean one of the things that we need to do is our is our um, baseline self-assessments and if 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 women and birth and people are doing that then they will identify issues early on for themselves to be able to access the single point of, mm. of 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 um service so um which will be great which makes self-referral even more important. No, that's good. absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much, Zoe and Rachel, for joining us. Thank I you told for you, us. I always it's say the quickest this, hour. <laughs> this hour goes quicker than any other hour I ever know. So thank you so much for joining us and, and spending some of your holiday with us. Oh, talking oh, about what we like. Yeah, yeah and I think <laughs> you better go and have a swim immediately. <laughs> in that, Sorry in for that. our IT. Um, oh, yeah. In <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. Now, I just have to, to, to round up a little bit just to remind people that um, resources will be available on the website and on Facebook on Friday. And don't forget some bookings. Get your diaries out, everybody who's watching. Next week, got maternity and midwifery hour, same place, same time. Uh, 8th of June, we've got personalised maternity care building in Ockenden, and this has got a stellar cast. You've got Baroness Cumberledge, Anna Maidley, you've got Tracy Cooper, Becky Westbury, Sunita Sharma and Benish Nazmin as well, and Chris Binney. So it's a really fantastic event in London, but there is a, an online facility as well for those who can't make it. And of course, if you book, as for anything um, with the Maternity and Midwifery Forum, you'll if you book for anything, you get the the um, the show, the whole thing. I will say the video show afterwards. Everything is recorded, so that's fantastic. 29th of June, we've got a student celebration event, so book now for that. North Manchester Festival is on the 21st of June, so if you haven't registered, get registering for that. That's um, our usual hybrid, so it's face-to-face -face and online. And then if you're really efficient, Wales and Southwest is on the 13th of September. And so book for that as well. So I, I just want to say another big thank you to Rachel and Zoe for being with us this, this, this evening. And thank you to everyone who's joined us from all over the world, including um, Nigeria and um, Greece and USA and UK and wherever you are. But wherever you are, take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week um, and be good, but not too good. Mm -hmm.